The Lord has risen indeed, but it was very hard for that to sink in. Jesus Christ overcame the deadness of his body in an instant, but it took just a bit longer to overcome the deadness in his disciples' hearts and to awaken belief in the fact that he was really alive. And he said to those disciples along the road, Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe. He wasn't always very polite or tactful. He says, You dummies, uh, you're a little slow. That's basically what he said. You dummies, you're a little slow. And we see that again and again throughout this passage that they were slow and they weren't really counting on Jesus coming back to life. The women went to the tomb taking spices they had prepared. They expected to find a dead body and their purpose was to honor the dead and make the corpse smell a little better. The angels asked the question, why are you looking for him here? Why would you look for the living among the dead? You don't ordinarily go to a graveyard to find somebody who's alive. And so um, the angels are saying, what in the world are you guys thinking? When the women came back with the news of the angels' message that Jesus was risen, what did the 11 apostles do and the others who were with them? The words of the women seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Ah, it's an old wives' tale. You know, women, they're a little gullible. They, they believe this maybe, but <laughs> we're too level-headed for that. Uh, the, the men walking along the road to Emmaus have heard the report of the women that the tomb is empty and that they've heard a message that Jesus is alive. And how do they feel about it? When a stranger comes up to them, they stand still looking sad because they are still very depressed. When Jesus actually appears among the disciples, even after some of them know he's alive, they're startled and frightened and think they are seeing a ghost. And when it begins to dawn on them that it's for real, even then they still disbelieved for joy. So when Jesus said, um, you dummies, you're kind of slow, he was definitely telling the truth. Now, we can understand it just a bit, though. If, if you had seen somebody die, if you had seen nails pounded through his hands and feet, if you had seen a sword or spear thrust into his body and the blood and water come running out, if you had seen that cold, dead body flopping down from the cross and lugged off and laid in a cold tomb, that's real stuff. That corpse was really, really, really dead. And so words don't always cut it when you're told in advance, oh, yeah, I'm going to die and rise again. Words are one thing, but death is right there staring you in the face. And you know the statistics on death. One out of one people die and 0% um, rise from the dead. You know, we, we know what we see, we know our statistics, and so we're going to be slow of heart to believe. But throughout this passage, even the dummies and the slow uh, come to discover the reality of Jesus' resurrection. He's really risen. And this morning, maybe some of us are a little bit dummies and a little bit slow, and we need that life and that joy revived in our hearts again, and that certainty of Jesus' resurrection rekindled in us. So let's look at some of the facts that these people had to face. The first fact was the tomb was empty. There was no corpse there. When they went in there expecting to doll up a corpse, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. That remains an important piece of evidence for Jesus' resurrection. His body was never produced. Uh, it, his grave was guarded by soldiers sealed with the seal of the government, and yet it somehow vanished and nobody could come up with a body. There was the testimony of angels, and these angels were impressive. These two men in dazzling garments who stood before the women were so impressive that the women fell down before them. And so when people that great and that impressive say, He's not here, He has risen, it's pretty important to face that fact. When two of God's glorious angels say something, it should be taken very seriously. And when they said he's risen, they also said, didn't you remember what he said while he was still with you? And so Jesus' own predictions are another very important piece of factual evidence. 
Everything happened as he had said regarding his death, and it also happened um, as regarded his resurrection. And when the angels reminded him, then it says, well, they did remember his words. It says in the Gospel of John that at first they still didn't realize from the Scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. But Jesus' predictions had been made, and the Old Testament prophecies had said so. And this is one great thing that Jesus explained first to those travelers on the road to Emmaus, and then later on to that larger gathering of disciples when he appeared among them. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And that must have been one of the great Bible studies ever done. Um, we'll do just a quick flyover of some of the things Jesus might have said to those disciples and that he still says to us. Because one of the great evidences for the reality of Jesus and the authority of the Bible is the way that things were written centuries before Jesus came along came true in Jesus' life. He began with Moses. Very early in the writings of Moses, in Genesis chapter 3 already, it speaks of offspring of a woman who will crush the serpent's head. And the serpent, though, would strike at this Savior's heel. Later in Moses, a ram dies in place of Isaac. At first, Abraham is told to sacrifice his own son, but then God provides a ram as a substitute to die in place of the one who was scheduled to die. And you can imagine Jesus explaining to the disciples this principle of, of a substitute dying for others who would otherwise die. The Passover lamb in the second book of Moses died instead of the firstborn. And so again, you had substitutionary death. The day of atonement in which all the sins of the people are laid on a goat and he's sent off as a scapegoat into the desert and another one the sins are put on him and he's slaughtered. All of these rituals and all the other sacrifices are part of what Moses um, is saying in his books and pointing to Jesus Christ. Jesus said to Nicodemus, and I imagine he said to these disciples on the road to Emmaus, um, as Moses raised up that snake in the desert after so many people had been bitten and were dying and were told to look at it and be healed. As Moses raised up that snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. God had said to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. So, in beginning with Moses, I've just given quick highlights from the first five books of the Bible, the five books of Moses, that show the necessity of Jesus dying and of Jesus being the substitute for our sins. And, and there were many other prophecies he could have pointed to. We're not going to get into all of them today. Prophecies about his birth, being born in Bethlehem, coming up out of Egypt, um, growing up in Nazareth. All of that is prophesied in the Old Testament. Prophecies of his miracles, of giving sight to the blind, of speech to the mute, of hearing to the deaf. Um, we've been reading in our Bible reading plan in the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah has a lot of those prophecies about this great healer. But we're just going to pass over all of those and just go straight to the prophecies of his rejection. A prophecy of Judas, even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. On the Thursday night, just before Jesus died, um, he said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, all of you are going to be scattered, each to his own home. You're going to leave me all alone. Yet I'm not alone, because my Father is with me. But he told them that they were all going to be scattered, and it was just in line with this um, saying of Zechariah. Isaiah 50, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. This is exactly how Jesus was treated on that Thursday night and that Friday morning. And then prophecies of crucifixion itself. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They pierced my hands and my feet. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. They're yelling, I trust in God. Let the Lord rescue him if he wants him. I thirst. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. All of those in Psalm 22, thousand years before the crucifixion. The prophecies of how he would die. Not one of his bones will be broken. You can almost hear Jesus telling those two on the road, did you notice that the other two who were crucified um, on either side of the Christ uh, had their bones broken to hasten their death, but he was already dead? Well, that was spoken of a long time ago. 
Did you see how he was pierced? Well, it said in Zechariah, they'll look on the one they've pierced. Isaiah said he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Did you notice how that rich guy, Joseph of Arimathea, was there to take the body down from the cross and lay it in his own rich man's grave? Were you paying attention, guys? Oh, there's a few other prophecies you guys seem to have forgotten. You will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. You guys are dummies. You're a little slow. But let me just tell you a few things. And he told them much more than this, I'm sure. But he pointed to them. He pointed them to these Old Testament scriptures that were about himself, about his suffering and death, and his resurrection. And we still have those scriptures today, and we still have that amazing match between ancient prophecy and the life and death and resurrection of Jesus the Messiah. And we have these facts to deal with when we are foolish and slow of heart to believe. And not only that, we also have physical contact. Let's face it, in this story, people didn't really start believing until Jesus was right there in front of their nose and they were touching him and they were watching him eat some fish. Jesus stood among them. He tells them to look at his hands and feet. It's I myself, touch me and see. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you ever anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. And so this is the, the core fact of Easter. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a shame that there are even some pastors and theologians who are still trying to do what the women did, make the corpse smell good. They say he's dead, but, boy, his teaching lives on, and doesn't that have a nice influence, and, and so on. Well, Jesus didn't seem to think that he wanted to live on through his teaching. He got the notion he wanted to live on as himself in his resurrection body. And so he showed them, he ate fish with them, and he did this on quite a number of occasions. Thomas missed that first appearance because Thomas decided to skip church. You never know what you're going to miss when you skip. Um, he missed something big, but he said, and I'm never going to believe it either until I can put my finger in the nail holes and put my hand into his side. And so when they were gathered the next time, Thomas at least decided, well, I don't think I'll skip this week just in case something happens. And he showed up, and so did Jesus. And Jesus said, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it into my side. And we read of many different resurrection appearances. Luke tells us that Jesus appeared to his disciples over a period of 40 days and proclaimed to them the kingdom of God. Before he ascended into heaven, he spent 40 days um, speaking with and showing himself to various people. In fact, according to the Apostle Paul, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. And Paul adds, most of them are still alive. So you can just check it out. Go talk to them. Because you had all of these different people who saw and heard and touched and watched him eat. And they were certain of his resurrection. And they were such different personality types. Thomas, obviously, was a pretty skeptical kind of guy. Uh, Matthew was evidently good with numbers and um, a tax man. And you had some people who weren't real quick to believe stuff. In fact, they were all pretty much in that boat of being slow of heart to believe. So it's not like they were gullible um, and just said, Oh, yeah, that, <laughs> you know, we wanted him to rise, and so we're going to believe that he rose. They didn't believe until they had had this physical contact with our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was because of that that they became absolutely certain of it. And looking back from a distance, somebody might be tempted to say, well, yeah, we know that that stuff is written in the Bible, but how can we really rely on that? Well, you need to consider the next piece of evidence. Um, Jesus' followers died insisting they had seen the risen Lord. Now, the story that was circulated back in that day was that a few of his disciples had somehow sneaked through all those soldiers and made off with the body. But that raises the question, would you die for a lie? 
Would you lie about seeing the risen Jesus and then die for that lie? You know, Peter, that is the absolute correct answer. Peter ended up being crucified upside down. Peter didn't take it back. He didn't say, well, you know, actually, I didn't see Jesus alive. He went to his death insisting that he saw Jesus alive, and he's the one who wrote, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And he was not going to give up because he knew what he had seen. He knew whom he had met alive again. Stephen was one of Jesus' followers who had seen the risen Lord, and then he saw Jesus again just before his, his own death. He didn't say, well, now that, it, now that I see all you guys with rocks, I, I've got some second thoughts. He said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, and his face became like that of an angel. And that had a powerful impact on Paul later on, who was supervising the killing of Stephen. James, actually I can mention two Jameses, one was James, who, of the three close friends of Jesus, Peter, James, and John, James had his head chopped off by Herod. He didn't say that, oh, um, I think I'm going to change my story. He went to his death insisting and preaching the resurrection. James, the brother of Jesus, was killed by a mob throwing rocks at him. And he, too, insisted that he had seen Jesus alive. The Apostle Paul says, well, the Lord appeared to me as to one untimely born. You know, I didn't get a resurrection appearance during those 40 days, but the Lord appeared to me on the road to Damascus, and I saw the risen Lord there. And Paul had his head chopped off, and he kept proclaiming the resurrection until the day of his death. Thomas, that big skeptic, carried the gospel to India and was killed there. Now, some say, well, you know, some of these stories are recorded in history, and so they have... Uh, all the certainty of anything else we know from history because they're written in books. Um, Thomas, some doubted the sources because the name of the king who was said to have ordered his execution, nobody ever heard of that king, and so, you know, he can't believe in anything like that. And then they dig up some story, and there's the name of this king, and evidently he ruled a major territory and was a really important guy. And there are remnants of the Martoma church, um, the, the Thomas church, as it's called, in India um, to this day. And so you have all of these people who died, and I could go on with the list. The only one of the 12 um, who didn't die was uh, John. Of course, he died, but he died in exile on the prison island of Patmos. So he didn't exactly have it cushy either. None of them profited from proclaiming the resurrection, at least profiting in getting rich or those kind of terms. They profited forever, but they just plain knew what they had seen. And so we have to... Um, just face these facts of an empty tomb, of angel testimony, of Jesus' predictions, of the Old Testament prophecies, of the physical contact by hundreds of people who saw Jesus after he was alive, and by the fact that so many of them sealed their story with their blood rather than change what they had to say. And then a final fact is the personal transformation that has occurred in so many lives over the centuries, millions have experienced Christ living in our hearts and transforming our lives. And that's also just a fact that must be faced about the risen Christ. Now, I don't want the fact that Jesus lives in our hearts to be the sum total of the resurrection. I trust you understand that by now. Uh, we sing the song, you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Well, he does, but that's not the only place he lives. He also lives in his own resurrection body as the resurrection accounts repeatedly show. But having taken that physical fact and that as reality, then we also do know that Christ does live also in believers by His Holy Spirit, and that is repeated again and again in the Bible. Christ lives in me. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And so we can sing, I serve a risen Savior. And He's risen in His resurrection body, and He is risen in our hearts. He is really risen. And this has a huge impact. It's not worth going into all of this detail about why we can believe in the resurrection and be absolutely certain of it if it didn't matter. You know, if there's just some little factoid out there that happens to be true, I'm still not going to spend much time trying to convince you of it if it doesn't matter. This matters. First of all, it matters because the resurrection displays Jesus' deity. 
Romans 1 verse 4 says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power by His resurrection from the dead. When Thomas saw Jesus, he said in John 20 verse 28, My Lord and my God. Jesus' claims to be God were proven true when He rose from the dead. Another thing it indicates is that His sacrifice is sufficient. If Jesus had continued to lie in that grave forever, it would have been God's message that that man and his sacrifice did not achieve much. His death was because he deserved it and because he has not paid for anything. But the fact that God raised him from the dead means that all sins have been paid for and his sacrifice is sufficient. Romans 4 verse 25 says, God handed him over to death for our sins and raised him for our justification. He raised him for our justification. And that means when he raised him, he was saying, this sacrifice is sufficient, and I'm crediting all of his goodness to those who believe in him. Another thing it means is that his teaching is true. Jesus ran into people who would keep saying, well, give us a sign, give us a sign. Well, at one level, that was pretty lame. You know, he, he had done an awful lot. That was pretty impressive. But he said, I'll give you one sign. Here's one sign that you should believe what I teach. I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man is going to be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, and then he's coming out again. You want a sign? There it is. And once that happens, you know that my teaching is true. His reign is reliable. His resurrection proves that he is the Lord of everything and that he's ruling over all things. 1 Corinthians 15 says he's going to reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. Philippians 2 says that he laid down his life and in the death of the cross and therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's reigning. He's enthroned. His name's above every name. Uh... This one's a little obvious. Death is defeated. That's one of the great things we celebrate on Easter. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, but we already know Jesus has defeated death and will defeat him for us too because of what happened in the resurrection. He lives. And because he lives, we'll live too. The demons are doomed. He disarmed the rulers and authorities by his death on the cross and also by his glorious resurrection in which he destroyed the one who holds the power of death and freed those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death, according to Hebrews chapter 2. And so the defeat of death, the doom of the demons, is a great part of the immense impact of the resurrection. Our faults are forgiven. I'm not going to go through all of Ephesians 2, one of the great passages for memorizing. You were dead in your transgressions and sin, and God out of His great love made you alive in Christ, and He forgave us all our trespasses. By grace you've been saved. And this is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Our faults are forgiven. We're made right with God. That's what the resurrection does. Our rebirth is real. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He's given us new birth. He's caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The very life of Jesus Christ by which He rose from the dead is the life that He puts into us the power that He puts into us, the very Spirit who raised Him is the Spirit who gives us rebirth. And that is a remarkable thing, and it does tell us, too, that once you've been born again, it's going to transform your life. It's just crazy for people to say, well, I received Jesus as Savior, and now I'm just going to go on with my life. Man, if you've been born again, if you have the resurrection life of Jesus Christ in you, things are going to start changing. And our rebirth is real when we know the risen Lord. And as Peter goes on to say, um, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection and into an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade. Our inheritance is imperishable. Heaven is not some dreamy hope. It is as certain as those hands and feet and as that broiled fish that Jesus chewed on. That's how certain our inheritance is. It can't perish, it can't spoil, it can't fade because it's kept in heaven for you and you're shielded by God's power. That's what Peter says. And it's the power that raised Jesus from the dead 
that gives that inheritance, that shields that inheritance. And our future is physical. It's not just dreamy cloudland. He will make our bodies like His glorified body, Paul says in, in Philippians 3, verse 21. I could go on. That's just kind of a, a rough top ten list of some of the impact of the resurrection and why it matters so much. But what a tremendous thing it is that He is really risen. In this story that we've been reading, how do they recognize Him? Well, as Jesus is explaining the Bible to them, their hearts start to leap and they start to burn within them and their hearts are set on fire. Another thing that happens is they don't want Jesus to leave. <laughs> they don't really quite recognize Him as Jesus yet, but whoever this guy is, they want more of Him and they invite Him home. He's made known to them in the breaking of the bread and when he reappears, it's in a gathering of the believers together. And still today, we recognize the risen Lord in much the same way. And I think Jesus did this on that first Easter to give us cues how we're to recognize him even after he's gone to heaven and isn't going to put in a physical appearance in our assembly today. Did not our hearts burn within us when you hear the word of God and something leaps in you and and you're growing in, in warmth and you're saying, boy, what's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on. It's not just that page that you're reading or just that guy who's doing some talking. It is the Son of God speaking to you with His authority and with His life. And you are meeting Him and you are hearing Him. When this is happening and you've come to to get a hint of what's going on. These people want Jesus to come home with them. And Jesus himself says to the church, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. On this Easter, invite him in. Ask him in and enjoy fellowship and friendship with him and see what else is going to happen once you've invited him in. He was known to them in the breaking of the bread. That's a wonderful statement in the Bible. Just as he breaks the bread, their eyes are opened. I don't know what it was. The Bible says they were kept from recognizing him. So maybe in that moment, or the Lord just opened their eyes. Or maybe they'd seen him break bread before when he fed the 5,000. Or um, when he was having a supper with them. Maybe they caught a glimpse of a nail print on his hand. Whatever it was, it was in the breaking of the bread that they recognized him. And today it is... Still, when we're around the table breaking bread together in daily worship, we may suddenly recognize that Christ is among us. When we're having table fellowship with fellow believers, that is a place where Christ appears among us by His Spirit and, and reveals Himself to the eyes of our heart. When we come together at the Lord's table each week and when we worship together, Christ is made known to us in the breaking of the bread. And He is doing that just as surely as He made Himself physically known to those men on the road to Emmaus. The prayer in Ephesians 1 speaks of that. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. So you see what he's saying. You need the eyes of your heart enlightened, and then you will begin to realize the power of the risen Christ. And today, that's my prayer for each of us, that the eyes of our heart are going to be open and that we'll know that He's really risen and rejoice in Him. You see, in this story, it's very clear that it was possible to see the risen Lord without recognizing Him. It's just as possible to recognize the risen Lord without seeing Him. You know, you could see him without recognizing. You can also recognize without seeing. You recognize him when you hear the scriptures as Jesus' own voice speaking to you. You recognize him when you open your heart to him and you ask him to make himself at home in you. You recognize him when you receive the bread, not just from my hand or from the hand of an elder. It is surely the hand of Jesus Christ himself giving that bread and that cup to you. It is his voice saying, this is my body, this is my blood. Not just the person who happens to be standing up front, it is Jesus Christ. And when you gather in His name, 
Jesus says, wherever two or three or two or three hundred are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Have you believed? Because you've seen me, Jesus said to Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The Lord has risen indeed. He comes even to us who are a little slow of heart, a little dumb at times, and he gives us ample reason to believe in his physical resurrection. And he comes to us and opens the eyes of our heart and comes to live in our hearts. The Lord is risen indeed. May his life be your joy. May his glory begin to shine within you and then shine from you so that wherever you go, people will know that you serve a risen Savior. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this great good news of the gospel. We thank you, Jesus, that you brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And we thank you, Lord, that you caused your light to shine in our hearts through the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so today we pray that when we are held down by doubts or just by the struggles and difficulties of our own lives, that you'll lift our eyes to you, the risen Lord, that you by your spirit will touch our hearts and transform us more and more into your image by the power of that resurrection life. And we pray, Lord, that you will make us witnesses as those first disciples were, so certain that even death could not change their minds as they willingly were martyred for their testimony to you. Make us, Lord, just as sure by the power of your Holy Spirit, just as bold, just as joyful, so that in us we will have the joy unspeakable and full of glory, the peace that surpasses understanding, the love greater than which no one has, that we're willing to lay down our life for our friend Jesus, that we'll lay down our life for our fellow believers, that we will serve you with our whole heart until the time comes when you come to claim us. We pray, Lord, for your quick return too. You promised when you ascended that you would come again as we had seen you go. And so we do pray that you will again physically walk among us and physically transform this creation and physically raise our bodies to be like your glorified body so that God may be all in all. We pray in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.